and welcome to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. Thanks for joining me. I release content on a Wednesday and a Sunday, so if you like crime deep dives and you like consistency, then this is definitely the channel for you. I've got over a hundred crime videos now, so if you haven't watched them all, go back and binge them immediately. Not immediately watch this one first. Also, my membership is out, so if you want lots of perks, you also want a live once a month, you want to get involved in a Discord chat, please join. And thanks to all my Patreon subs. My podcasts are going to be coming thick and fast. I have an undercover cop on there, DCI Paul Settle as well, guy famed for the fact that he got blown up by the IRA on his first day on the job and loads of other things. But the main part of all of that is just to say thank you as ever for all your incredible support. You're the reason that I get to make better content all the time because I can devote myself more to this. And today's case I have devoted myself to because you guys asked me to cover it and I thought I knew quite a lot about it. And then I realized I genuinely didn't. So I'm gonna be covering the case of the Turpins, which many of you have actually got involved and got in touch with me to ask me to cover. Also on my membership, I'm gonna be putting out suggestions, giving you opportunities to get involved in polls where you get to choose the next cases. So lots of these will be coming from the fact that you want them covered. And it helps me because like I said, I know a lot about crime, but often there are cases, particularly in other countries that I'm just not aware of. The Turpins I was aware of because it was such a big story. But like I said, even though I've watched interviews with the children stroke young adults that were affected i didn't know just how horrific the experiences were of these incredible survivors because that's what we're talking about today we're talking about survival over adversity and the twists and turns that that involves so 14th of january 2018 i'm going to take you back to that day so it's only a few years ago standing in the road in the early hours of the morning all by herself 17 year old jordan turpin calls 911. she was literally in the middle of the road because she genuinely didn't understand footpaths she didn't have the social understanding of the etiquette of being outside essentially she told the call handler i just ran away from home and we have abusing parents. My two little sisters right now are chained up. The 22 minute call would basically mark the start of an investigation that would just entirely grip a nation, grip a world with respect and give us all an insight into a family home that eventually was dubbed and rightly so it was dubbed, the house of horrors. This is 911, do you have an emergency? Um. I just ran away from home. Do you know what street you're on? Um, no. Uh, I just ran away from home because I was in a family of 15, okay? Can you hear me? And we have abusing parents. The abusive parents that Jordan had referred to were 57-year-old David Allen Turpin and his wife, 49-year-old Louise Anna Turpin. They were both Pentecostal Christians. Now, as part of their belief system, one of the facets of that was to have as many children as they could, because it was basically a belief that God called on them to do so. So between 1988 and 2015, they would go on to have 13 children, 10 daughters and three sons. And interestingly as well, every single one of their children's names began with a J. However, in spite of these incredibly religiously held beliefs, it feels that their actions were completely at odds because the way that they treated the blessings that were their children is unimaginable to me and it will be unimaginable to you and I'm sure for those of you who already know this case it is already unimaginable that I am going to tell this story of children who should have been born into a place of protection care compassion and of course love 
Now, before we get into the deep dive of what actually went on, let's just take a moment to look at Louise in particular, the mum in this situation. Because we always have to consider the possibilities that have arisen from a child's experience in their own childhood. So we can look at some explanation for Louise's behaviour because she had a very abusive childhood. She was failed really badly. First of all, her parents had a really fractious relationship. It was not a good relationship. There was a lot of arguing in the home. She and her siblings, her sisters, they would often witness very fierce arguments. And we all know that no child wants to grow up in a home where it feels like their primary caregivers are at war because it doesn't make them feel safe. It's also a poor role modeling experience because you're building your basis of how you expect to be in relationships through the experiences of watching your parents. But anybody on a primordial level knows that if somebody is screaming or shouting, the obvious reality is that most people just wanna run away. When you're a kid, you don't have that option. You just have to sit there and bear the scenario. And that's poor for our mental health. So Louise had this at home. Add to that the fact that she was indeed badly bullied at school, and it was bad bullying. That paled in insignificance to what her own mother did to her, though. So her mother, Phyllis, would basically sell her and her sister, Teresa, to a very wealthy paedophile. Yes, you heard me correctly. Her own mother, Phyllis, just sold her to a wealthy paedophile so that they could be her cash cow. So they were routinely abused, but it seems that Louise was the favorite. She in particular experienced more abuse than the others, which is just horrifying. Teresa, her sister, would later actually tell the media, he would slip money into my hands as he molested me. I can still feel his breath on my neck as he whispered, be quiet. We begged not to take us to him, but she would simply say, I have to clothe and feed you. Yeah. Can you imagine a little girl begging not to be put in the hands of a child molester and your mother basically say, well, if you want clothes and you want food, this is the price you're gonna have to pay. It is horrifying because no child should ever face a predator anyway, but the idea that it's your own mother selling you to those individuals to literally leading you to the lair of the lion is just horrifying. According to Teresa also, she and her mother and her siblings were actually all sexually abused by another family member. So there had been, shall we say, some kind of family historic pattern where molestation is experienced. And Louise would actually sacrifice herself and she would sacrifice herself just so her sisters and her cousins didn't need to actually be abused. So she put herself in the line of fire. Basically, she wanted to protect them. Now on one level, there is certainly some heroism there, isn't there? That Louise as a little girl who was ultimately placed in these terrifying situations and put through the most arduous and despicable types of molestation, wanted to prevent her cousins and her sisters from going through the same. So she placed herself in that position. And that isn't admirable. We can't use the word admirable because it sounds like there is a choice space there that comes from a place of really great opportunity to be the person who stands up, right? No child should have to place himself in that situation. She sacrificed herself. That's the word that we would use, isn't it? She sacrificed herself. But it certainly shows that back then, she understood what was right and what was wrong. And yes, she placed herself in that position of sacrifice because she knew how awful it was. And even though she was going through these terrible feelings, she didn't want anybody else to have to experience them or at least experience them at a lesser rate than she did. And it shows great courage as well as sacrifice. But you would imagine that those early experiences, if anything, would fully shape her to realize that the last thing that she would ever allow anyone to do would be to hurt her own children. Because essentially, 
that's what happens in the future. To me, the fact that she'd been through these really dreadful, terrible experiences makes her future behaviour towards her own children even more inexplicable. Now, her other sister, Elizabeth, she also gave an insight into Louise's character and mindset later down the line, so as Louise got older. And what she said was her behaviour just became more and more alarming, particularly when she hit her 40s. So Louise had never been anything like a wild child, but it feels like when she hit her 40s, she was trying to make up for it. And this is how she described her. She was drinking, smoking, partying, going to bars, practicing witchcraft, gambling, handling and eating rattlesnakes, dressing and acting vulgar on MySpace, into sex practices, and it goes on and on. I was really concerned for her. I mean, I don't know about you guys, it's just a general Friday night for me. If I'm not out somewhere handling and then eating rattlesnakes, if I'm not practicing a bit of witchcraft, if I'm not just getting involved in some kind of lewd sexual practices, then I don't know what's happened to my weekend. Apologies for the sarcasm. But we can see, obviously, she has gone down a trajectory that isn't expected for her family. That noted as well, when you are sexually molested as a child and you don't have a lot of power as a child, as you get older, you may be somebody who abstains from sexual contact and intimacy because it repulses you, you have an aversion to it. You may develop a healthy relationship, that's the ideal, a healthy relationship with sex that you deserve because anybody who's been molested deserves a healthy, loving, intimate relationship. Or you could arguably become highly promiscuous because actually your self-worth is pretty low and you seek validation in other people and the way that they react and reflect the way that you are in your life. So there are possibilities why somebody can get involved in, shall we say, at times troubling, at times dangerous, and at times extreme forms of sexual connection. Not sure about the rattlesnake though, never come across that one in my research with respect. Also worries me that her sister didn't specify that she was handling them and then going somewhere that they served them as opposed to just handling the rattlesnake and then eating it. That disturbs me, the idea that it was uncooked as somebody who doesn't eat anything that was alive. It disturbs me anyway. Anyway, in contrast, when you look at David, the father in this story, well, his childhood was very, very different. His upbringing didn't give us any insight really as to why he ended up being the person that he becomes. Because realistically, he was known as quite a nerdy kid. He had a very promising academic ability. He studied computer engineering at Virginia Tech University. And bear in mind, this is at a point where computer and tech is genuinely exploding. And the wages that you could expect were also exploding too. So he was very much at the forefront of this new industry that was just blowing up and meant that he could really create and forge a very good life for himself and his family. So he worked for both Lockhead Martin and Gerald Dynamics Aerospace Companies before he retires in 2012. So like I said, somebody who was very bright and also had the most amazing opportunities at his fingertips because of what he'd studied and his natural ability to get involved in computers. And David and Louise met for all this. They met at Princeton High School in West Virginia. David was substantially older than Louise with respect. He was eight years older and they had started dating behind Louise's father's back. Now her mum did know, but she allowed her to carry on seeing David. I think we can all agree that as Louise's mother was just 
basically using her daughters to be molested so she could earn money, she wouldn't really be that concerned about an eight year age gap. It's as simple as that. She's just going to be uh, happy to have her daughter do anything and go anywhere because she has no morals or boundaries, in my opinion. Apparently, the reason that she allowed her to see David, though, was she trusted her daughter. She trusted her daughter. Well, I imagine you're the absolute epitome of discernment when it comes down to ensuring that your child is safe, looking at your past history. The pair end up eloping. This is when David's 24 and Louise was actually just 16. Now the police stop them. This is when they're in Texas. And I like that. I like the fact that the police clearly looked at a couple and felt that there was an age gap and wanted to intervene. And they basically get sent home. However, as opposed to this leading to Louise's father saying, how long have you been seeing each other? My daughter's only 16 and now you're eloping. This suggests that you've been together for a time frame that I am unhappy with, be it that you are nearly a decade older than my young daughter. But that didn't happen. Of course it didn't happen. It never happens in these kind of crimes that I'm talking about, does it? So basically, after the police send them home, Louise's father just doesn't object to the union. In fact, he's like, hey, hey, what are you doing with all this eloping? Why elope? I'm a preacher. Let's have a proper ceremony. So yeah, even you two, the two eloping, thought there might be a bit of a problem, you know, with the big age gap and the fact that you've been seeing each other privately that kind of suggests that you both know the relationship is on dodgy ground age-wise. And so you decide to run away. And when that gets thwarted, you return home expecting, understandably, to have a little bit of a wrath of your parents. And instead you get, hey, let's organize a buffet and do this properly. Great use of parental boundaries there. So they marry in Virginia in 1984. This is before they move to Fort Worth, which is in Texas, in 1990. What's very telling is at this point, after they've moved to Fort Worth, Louise basically breaks off all contact with her parents after that. And she breaks off contact to the point where she doesn't even go to her parents' funerals. And there is a part of me that goes, well, when you're in a coercively controlling relationship, this is very common. We know that if somebody is in a relationship with another person who is controlling, who makes them feel afraid of the repercussions should they choose actions that they don't agree with, that the ramifications can be so dangerous for them that they basically just do whatever the will of their partner is. However, I also think this could well be Louise reacting to the abandonment that she felt as a child growing up, that she doesn't want to go and spend time being sad about her mother who's died because her mother literally used her as a basic sex slave to pay the bills. And her father, who could potentially have shown some kind of parental boundaries by saying, I do not approve of your relationship with your partner and why you've ran off, didn't. He validated it. So it could be that Louise felt fundamentally completely let down and the reality is that she just decided that she didn't want anything to do with her parents ever again. That kind of makes sense as well. To the rest of the family, David and Louise actually seemed, as far as they were concerned, from the outside looking in, to have a really perfect marriage. And I guess if you just look at the Western variables that we might place on success, you can kind of understand why they would think that. So first of all, as I said, David is intelligent, he's good at what he does, and he had a really well-paid job. A well-paid job that meant that they had a really big house, they had several cars, Louise didn't have to work. It's kind of my dream, that. Obviously, I love doing this. I love it. But could you imagine just having somebody who look after you and you didn't have to work if you didn't want to? I could just stay here all day just doing this every day for the rest of my life, just having fun. But realistically, for us mere mortals, that's highly unusual. But if that was your life, your neighbours and your mates are probably going to be a little bit jealous. Louise has also seemed to have really expensive clothes, purses, just anything she wanted she was given. And people felt that this couple were just living the high life. However, 
as is the case in certain scenarios when people have a whole load of items and seem to always be dressed in their designer gear and live in a way that most of us are kind of stood open mouthed at, it turns out that the couple were actually just massively living beyond their means on the never ever, so to speak, on the old credit cards. So this was getting them into a serious amount of debt. And also bringing back to what I said earlier on, remember about them being pretty strong Christians, kind of at odds with their ultra conservative beliefs. You know, I think when you think about Christianity and religion, one of the things that we're meant to have is humility and not masses of possessions because essentially that means that you don't really care that much about all the good that your money could do. Those kind of conflicts introduce us to a confused mindset, don't they? Also, just as an addition, bearing in mind what I've told you about their deeply religious roots, and the fact that they, for example, believe they need to populate the world with lots of children because it's God's will. There was a little side note that interested me because allegedly they were into swinging. Now, just so you're all out there and you're all aware, I'm a very liberal human being. I believe that whatever makes you happy, as long as you are consenting, as long as you feel good after you do whatever it is that you do and nobody gets hurt, then it is completely up to you whether you are in a monogamous relationship, a polyamorous relationship, or whether you're in a relationship with somebody who likes to bring in other people to the relationship to spice things up a little, do what you want. But it's kind of not in keeping with the whole, you know, till death do us part, in sickness and in health, like don't have sex with people that you don't know, that kind of thing that's always felt very much part of the Christian ethos. But I don't know, maybe God had called on them to do this on this occasion. And in fact, I told you I deep dive because it does interest me when I'm doing these, how to find little side additions to bring in that you might not be aware of. So on one occasion in 2009, they actually arranged for Louise to meet and sleep with a man in a motel in Alabama. And David was very dutiful. He dropped her off there and he collected her after. Now, a year later on their anniversary of that event, I know you're thinking, well, how could we mark such an occasion? Well, they decided to mark it like this. They were like, you know what we should do today on the anniversary of when I dropped you off with that strange man and you had sex with that strange man and then I picked you up afterwards from that strange man. Yeah, I think we should go back to the motel and book the room where you had sex with that strange man and we'll have sex there too without the strange man. Yes, that's what they did. A bit of me hopes that they changed the sheets. Now the family move from Fort Worth to a remote property in Rio Vista in 1999. And I've looked this property up. It was a four bedroom house on 36 acres of land. So I am introducing you there to clearly a very remote place. And on one level, remote houses with lots of land can give children the most idyllic childhoods where they have access to animals and the pleasures of nature and you know you really spoil if you look out with parents and siblings who are given those kind of opportunities but if you are in highly abusive scenarios or places where your family is falling into a state of dysfunction it can provide the perfect backdrop to a horrific scenario because how on earth can you allow people in to see the world that you're experiencing and protect you it's very difficult it becomes very easy for manipulators and perpetrators of abuse to essentially lock you down by 2007 louise and david have actually got 12 children and at this point they decide to move the eldest 10 out of the house and into a trailer on the grounds of the property. The fact that they keep the two youngest in the home, but they put the 10 oldest in a trailer introduces us to a possibility that the couple get bored. Once children start to get a little bit older, maybe they're not at the baby stroke toddler state, they lose interest because it seems that this will be a pattern where younger children, when they're very little, don't 
get to tolerate the same level of abuse that the older children have to. So just putting that out there, it's just my perspective, but I do think it makes sense. And the neighbors who obviously were around that remote location, they said that they were a really mysterious family. So first of all, David and Louise just didn't talk to other people. They didn't make any effort with the neighbors. They didn't socialize. Also, they noted that the lights were always on, but the blinds were always drawn. And one of the eldest girls actually tried to run away pretty soon after the family moved into the house, but she was found by a local resident and they returned her, which makes sense. Though I will always note that if a child ran away and I came across them and they admitted that, my primary motivation would be to understand why, what is it? that's led to this because it could just be that a teenager's had a bad argument with a parent has said something regrettable and is a bit scared and is creating some distance and is lost and afraid and doesn't really know how to go home without getting into serious trouble but just want to go home that tends to be the norm doesn't it but it could be that the child is at risk of serious harm it could be that the child is running away from a horrifically abusive scenario and it is a duty of an adult to really think about getting that information out of them. I do appreciate that these days more and more people are afraid who are adults to do that when they come across a child in distress because there is so much threat these days to that individual being called a whole heap of names or being suggested that they are somebody that they are not because they are actually concerned about a child and people are afraid to take children into their homes if they find them on the streets because they're terrified that somebody might accuse them of something untoward. But nonetheless, it is important that we think about how we would get that information out of a young person because we could be returning them to the lion's den. Now, the neighbour actually contemplated reporting the Turpins to authorities because they felt that the treatment of the children wasn't good, but they decided not to. One of the reasons for that was they came from a remote place, there wasn't a lot of people around, they didn't necessarily want any repercussions. And one of the big reasons for that is he knew, this neighbor knew, that David had a gun. I mean, is it just me? Is that just me who thinks, I think potentially these children could be at danger of abuse and I'm a little bit worried for their safety. Maybe I should inform the authorities because he could be dangerous, that father. Mm, maybe I won't because that father has a gun. Arguably, yes, he has a gun and you think clearly he might use it, which is why you're afraid of him. So that would give insight into why you definitely need to speak to the authorities. They're not gonna send you round, are they? They're not gonna be like, listen, neighbor, go and rescue those kids. Hey, pronto, come on, get it sorted. That's not how it would have played out. And again, there were those sliding doors moments, aren't there, which we've just talked about there. Because maybe if people had thought less about social etiquette and not getting on with your neighbors and more about potential abuse, I wouldn't be telling you this story right now. And this story gets worse and worse and worse. Turns out as well, the neighbors used to see David standing in a driveway shooting at cans. So I guess that's why they knew that he had arms, shall we say. David and Louise, from the get-go really, kept their children completely isolated from the outside world. And I don't just mean from neighbors, from the school system, from the local community, I mean from their family as well. Relatives weren't even allowed to see them. In fact, Louise's sister was the only person who met the eldest four kids in person once, once. I mean, she spoke to them over video, so she spoke to the other children over the video, but as time progressed, it became less and less and less. Louise would always claim that the reason for this was because her and David were just too busy with the kids. And the neighbors said that it was really rare that they ever saw the children. And when they did, the kids were not allowed to tell them the names. Another thing that the neighbors noted were that the children were always very pale, which they would be. If you're not getting outside, if you're not getting white light on your skin, if you're not actually being given an opportunity to get fresh air, it's going to affect your pallor, isn't it? And those kids were basically locked inside virtually all the time. 
And for the eldest children, to put this in context, that locking in all of the time lasted decades, decades. The children's isolation as well was massively reinforced because David and Louise didn't put them into school. So they allegedly, in strong inverted commas, homeschooled them. And their eldest child was actually pulled out of school after the third grade. So as Louise and her husband have more children, it feels like this increases the isolation and therefore increases the abuse as well. And it's at this point that they actually informed the California Department of Education that their home was basically in a religious practice school. They called it Sandcastle Day School which it wasn't, was it? Because it was kids who lived in that home who were there 24 seven. So it wasn't a day school anyway. It wasn't people visiting. It wasn't parents dropping the children off at a religious private school for the day. It was their kids in their home where the kids never left. Also, David was listed as the principal, even though he had no qualifications in any way, shape or form in education. And the truth was that the kids got no education whatsoever which is horrific because we've got lots of children all of different ages who aren't being given the very basic life skills that equips them for a future in society so the abusers aren't clearly concerned about those children ever being equipped for society it feels like there's no intention that their children are ever going to be able to lead a normal life that is not what David and his wife are trying to create right now. Now, Jordan Turpin, she later actually told authorities that even though she was 17, she'd never even completed first grade. Not even completed first grade. I mean, we've talked a lot about physical abuse, psychological abuse, emotional abuse. We've talked about sexual abuse. But when we think about all of those things, Education is often a way out of a situation, isn't it? Even in the most heinous scenarios where you are being subjected to the most terrible of abuse, when you have education behind you, it gives you this foundation and opportunity that allows you in the future, hopefully, to thrive. If you're not even given that opportunity, you don't have even that very basic foundation that can lead to being a game changer in your future. Only one of the older boys was actually allowed to attend the classes at a local college. And even in this case, where he was obviously considered different to the other children, Louise would actually drive him there, wait outside in the hallway during the class, and then take him home after the class has ended, which we'd all love, wouldn't we? I mean, your parents embarrass you anyway at certain ages, don't they? You're like, please don't hold my hand anymore. But I love you. Why wouldn't I hold your hand? Because you are my adult parent and you are no longer considered cool because you are over the age of 30. Please walk five steps behind me. Stop making eye contact. That's normal, isn't it? Is that just normal? Is it just me that that was normal for? I can completely remember particularly my youngest son being like, please just walk a little bit behind me and avoid kind of looking like there's any blood relationship here, mum. But imagine your mum waiting in the hallway just whilst you're doing your lesson. How to make friends. I mean, how to be the popular kid. I'd invite you to a party, but I'm really worried that that middle-aged woman might just turn up and wait in my hall when you come. So the Turpin family did move around. So they lived in various places in Texas and California. This was unbelievable. When new owners took over the Turpin's former Rizzo Vista home in the early 2000s, it was unbelievable. And I'm gonna talk to you about it because you're gonna get some insight into what these children were living with. So first of all, as I've said, you know, they like the privacy. And the new owners found that all the boarded up windows were there. So clearly the children had been living almost a nocturnal lifestyle. There was human waste on the walls and on the carpets. I mean, terrifyingly, they found scratches on the back of doors. They found ropes tied to beds. There were dead decomposing cats and dogs in the house. Yeah, 
literally decomposing cats and dogs in the house. Can you imagine the smell? Everything had locks on it, everything. The cupboards, the toy chest, even the fridge. Even the fridge. So you can tell, can't you? Everything is being controlled in that household. They had no beds, they were just mattresses, and there were piles of rubbish everywhere. It is like looking at a serious hoarder's place of residence. And obviously we appreciate that with people who have a hoarding mental state, it's very difficult for them to let go of those things. But we're not talking about that with this couple. We're talking about them just having no care or consideration for the place that they live. The interior was just trashed. In fact, it was so badly trashed that the floor in the bathroom had actually rotted through. And, oh, I have two hours. As you guys know, I have four two hours. I love my dogs. And the idea that anyone would hurt them is just something I don't even want to conceive of. But in that home, amongst all of this horrific debris, waste and decay, they found two chihuahuas still alive. And those animals had basically survived because they'd been eating waste from the soiled nappies. That's what had kept them going. Even the family truck that I talked about where the older 10 were placed was full of dirty nappies. So filthy, filthy environment. The Turpins move again in 2010, although one would imagine they probably haven't got good references for doing that. Could you please let me know about your prior tenants? Well, yes, I can. Three weeks later, you'd finish the list. Anyway, as I've said, they move again in 2010, this time to Moretta in California. Now, despite the fact that they have this brand new home, probably to ruin again, they have this massively ingrained dysfunctional life now, don't they? This has been going on for a long time. The reality of the Turpin household was very much in contrast to the way that they presented themselves to the world, of course. So people who knew David and Louise say that they lived in this complete fantasy on reflection when they thought about the interactions that they had with these two, talking about their family, it was a, a complete polarity to the reality of what was going on behind closed doors because they would talk really fondly of their children to others. And they went to great lengths to create this impression of a really happy family on their Facebook posts. And I will be honest, they didn't spend 24 seven in captivity, the children, because there were occasions that the children were allowed out. So David and Louise had this massive obsession with Disney. And I mean a massive obsession to the point where two of their actual car plates had Disney related car plates on them. D-Land and the other one was DL Forever. I mean, I like Disneyland, but I've never thought about having a private reg suggesting that affiliation and association. Nonetheless, whatever floats your boat, but again, are we being given an insight to, shall we say, an immature mindset? By the way, guys, I'm not saying you're immature if you like taking your kids to Disneyland. I'm just saying, when you think about the mindset of these individuals, they tend to spend more time with their youngest children. They tend to get bored of their older children. They certainly don't take responsibility in their lives. And they have this real connection with Disneyland to the point where, in spite of all of this abuse, that we're hearing about and this horrific lifestyle of dysfunction they're providing their children with, they actually take all the children on several trips to Disneyland. And during this period, when they're on holiday, they basically make the entire family wear matching Disney clothes, which again is presenting this picture perfect portrait. It's completely untrue. But for those moments, they're presenting to the world, not just good parents, but great parents who will spend a lot of money entertaining their children by taking them to the place where dreams are made of for children, because that's what Disneyland is like. It's literally most children's dream. Anyway, those rare trips don't continue either. They stop when the family start going through some financial problems. This is about 2011, and the Turpins end up filing for bankruptcy and they were bankrupt in a big way you know we're not talking about 
a company, talking about a family and individuals within that family, they had debts of between $100,000 to $500,000. So they were living way above their means. This is despite the fact that David, as I said earlier, had a really good job, an annual salary of $140,000. But nonetheless, this would have entertained some stresses and strains in the family, and certainly it ceased any of those Disney trips. 2014, again, they move. This time to Paris, California. And again, we're being introduced to the fact that the Turpins don't want to settle for long periods of time anywhere. Why? Well, because when you are abusing children, neighbors at times start to get wise to the fact that your family doesn't seem to operate like anybody else's family. That will draw intrigue. And when you have intrigue and curiosity, you can be exposed because people in the end make calls you don't want them to make, such as to social services or the police. Now, one of the reasons that the Turpins gave for wanting to be closer to Hollywood, in fact, because this is where the move was taking them, was because David and Louise had decided, you know what, we like this whole Disney thing, we like this celebrity, we like this world of glitz and glamour, that's why we have dead animals rotting away in our homes. What we need now is to be closer to Hollywood because we are clearly the right people for a reality TV show. Simple as that. We've watched Honey Boo Boo, we've watched the Kardashians, we've watched the huge amount of money that these opportunities present, and we feel like we are the ideal family to be the next reality TV superstars. I know. You're agreeing there, aren't you? Ryan Seacrest, missed opportunity there, Ryan. Missed opportunity. You thought you had it big with the Kardashians, mate, but you were just missing a beat here because David and Louise Turpin, they were the next big thing and you just, you just weren't on the ball, mate. But it shows again the fact that there is almost this naivety to David and Louise because if you think about the life they're providing those poor children and the ideas that they have going on in their own mind, they aren't thinking rationally because it would take a second for anybody to look into their lives to have all those children removed and rightly so. Because remember, as much as we're talking about David and Louise and the things that they think and the things that they believe are possible, what we're also thinking about in this is the subtext of what's happening, which is they have got children who are deserving of safety, nurture, opportunity, education, and they are literally held hostage to some degree in their home. They also plan to have more children, by the way, because they feel that that's a way to get this reality show, that if they have a huge family, that's gonna make them more interesting. And I guess we could say there is an indication here potentially of some delusional beliefs. Now, things eventually come to a head because the children over here, the parents talking about another move, apparently they are going to move to Oklahoma and David and Louise also are heard to agree that what they want to do is to, at this point, take them and keep every single one of the children chained up. That's right, chained up. This means that the siblings now realise that they will have literally no power. If they can't move, then they are beyond any opportunity to either escape or even have their own needs met or look after the siblings that are chained up, because remember, lots of them are. So this gives them a time frame, and that time frame is running out quickly, and they realize that they've got to devise a rescue plan. This actually wouldn't be the first attempt to escape their parents, by the way. They'd been massively planning previously to try to get away, and in fact, this one, this plan to escape had taken more than two years. But the big problem is that, as I've said, think about how these children have been kept, totally isolated from the outside world. They genuinely didn't have any supportive framework. They couldn't just call somebody from the family and ask them to come and help because obviously there had been distance placed between them. They didn't know the neighbors. 
They didn't even know how the world worked. They hadn't been to school. So it's bad enough to think about a coercive controlled state in the Western world when we think about, let's say, a woman or a man who has become isolated by their partner and had opportunities to function as a normal human being removed, such as going to work and having access to a bank account and all of those things. But usually that person will have at least some foundations that when they try to leave will return to help them. These kids haven't. They haven't even got relationships with friends that would enable them to make a change to their life, to make that escape seem possible. So it's terrifying for them. They've barely left the house in their entire lives. And this is why up until this particular escape I'm going to talk about today is the plans were always quite vague. In fact, the main plan that they had was they wanted to get to Vegas because it turns out that they had been there before. On very rare occasions, the parents had taken them there. And it was one of the few times they'd been happy. And you can imagine that, can't you? What do you want with your life? Well, if you haven't got great memories and there was one stand out because it was a time and a place that genuinely you felt free or at peace or just better than normal, then that's going to represent Nirvana for you, isn't it? So Vegas is that Nirvana. Naturally, one of the things that David and Louise did was they renewed the vows in 2013 at the Elvis Chapel. Yep, complete with an Elvis impersonator reverend. And that was something that obviously stayed with the kids. What's really sad about the pictures that you see there is all the kids are smiling, aren't they? They're acting happy. So you can see them trying to seem like everything is normal and probably just experiencing this micro moment of what life could be like. It's all a facade, isn't it? I mean, even the Elvis impersonator was filled. He later said that when he carried out that renewing of vows, what actually he felt was that these kids were cared for, that the Turpins really cared for their children. And Louise and David actually renewed their vows in Vegas on at least three occasions. I know, one may think once was enough, but not for Louise and David. No, any opportunity to get involved in some kind of reenactment event and they are there like a shot. But like I said, imagine being those children. Imagine everybody seeing you like you're just a happy, healthy young person and inside you're just being crucified with the reality of your experience. So this idea of escaping was always in the back of their minds, but it was vague because they didn't have the foundations to understand what would be required to achieve it. And one of the sisters had actually called a taxi company at one point, you know, basically asked how much would it cost for a taxi from Paris to Vegas. And when she was asked, okay, well, where in Paris do you want to go from and where in Vegas do you want to go to? She just panicked and she basically ended the call because she had this massive mistrust of the outside world because basically they would be told as children whatever the parents wanted them to believe, right? So the parents can just make any story up to them about what the world is secretly like and terrify them. They were also, as a group of young people and children, scared of what would happen if the families found out. So if their parents were informed of the fact that they were trying to escape, the ramifications that they would experience really worried them. They thought they'd be severely punished. And they also, underlying fear-wise, felt that they would be chained up for the rest of their lives. And that is an unenviable position to put in, isn't it? The idea that you think that your very escape could lead to you spending the rest of your life essentially in prison. Jordan Turpin, she actually posted videos of her life to YouTube, by the way. So she was called Lacey Swan, absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous young woman. And she'd do this when her parents had left the house. She'd make recordings, they were usually made in her bathroom, and they included her singing, her own songs, and, you know, just showing the bits of her life off that she wanted to show. And a viewer got back in touch with her and started to ask her questions, and it was this that suddenly illuminated something in her mind. Like, hang on a minute, there's a possibility here. If people are contacting me, then I could get help. And 
Also, she starts getting introduced to the fact there's a different life, a different world out there. And that seems to be a catalyst of change. And wow, what a catalyst of change it would become. So the early morning hours of 14th of January 2018, we've got 17-year-old Jordan Turpin and actually her 13-year-old sister. They put this rescue plan in motion. They weren't alone, by the way, in knowing that this was going to play out. In fact, five of the other children were also aware of the plan at the time. So they leave items under the bed covers and this is to make it look like they were sleeping. Jordan goes first. She goes through a first floor bedroom window and two minutes later, her sister goes. Now, sadly, her sister, she got lost. She gets frightened and she just returns home. She's defeated. And I understand this is a terrifying world outside, right? And at least the pain that you know is something you're used to. If you're concerned that the whole world outside might be even more dangerous, do you want to entertain that possibility? So she goes home, but Jordan doesn't. She goes further. And also, she's not gone by herself, essentially. She's taken an old mobile phone on her that she's found in the house. Now, it's deactivated. She can't call anybody else, but she can call one number, 911. She makes it a relatively safe distance from the house. And at this point, she calls the emergency services. And Jordan, actually, I've watched recalling the experience and I've heard her talk about this. And she said, my whole body was shaking. I was trying to dial 911, but I couldn't even get my thumbs to press the buttons because I was shaking so bad. But I was trying to calm down so I could do it. And then I finally pressed it and they answered. I literally never talked to someone on the phone. This call lasted 22 minutes. And Jordan at this point manages to detail the conditions that she and her siblings were living in. You imagine how this is for the person listening to this, right? You know, this girl on the phone basically saying she's never talked to somebody before on the phone. She hasn't got the normal savviness that you would expect for a teenager of any age, let alone somebody at 17. When the police car arrives, when they find her on the street. At this point, she just is flowing with information. She reiterates to him the neglect that she's been through, the abuse that she's been subjected to. She tells them how she's been living in filth. She said that the filth is so bad, in fact, that at times when she wakes up, it's so heavy in the air that it's almost impossible for her to breathe. She also showed him photos of the conditions of the house inside. So she's known, she's had this wherewithal, this savviness to think, it's not just gonna be enough to go out and call the police. I need them to see the reality of what we are experiencing. At this point, they're actually asking, are you taking any medication? She didn't even know what that word meant. This is how naive and innocent this girl is. When they're asking, are you taking medication? Understandably, they're gonna ask that question, you know? This story sounds outside the realms of reality. So if she was maybe taking some kind of drugs that had affected her mental state, it's important that they know that for her own protection, but she doesn't even know the world. What's going on? Okay. I just ran away from home. Okay. And I live in a family of 15. Okay. My two little sisters right now are chained up. They're chained up? Yes. Where are they chained up at? On the bed. Now, mother didn't chain them up just to be mean. Okay. They're chained up because they stole mother's food. Uh huh. But I'm sorry if I talk too much. Okay. I've never talked to anybody out there, so I don't, I don't I've never been alone with the person, so <clears throat> this is very hard for me to talk. Okay. How did you, do your parents know you left your house? No, they don't. Sorry. Do you take any medication? What's medication? Medication? Yeah, what's medication? Do you take pills? Do you take pills? Oh, I for... don't think I've ever taken a pill before. <clears throat> okay. Right, I have it. Um, my parents are abusing. They abuse us. But the reason I called and the reason I managed to get out here, this is one of the most scary things I've ever done. Uh -huh. I'm terrified. But I called because my two little sisters, they're chained up right now. Do you have pictures of that? Yes, I can show you. Now, Riverside 
county sheriff's deputies, they arrive at the Turpins family home shortly after this call is made and she's been picked up. Jordan is in the back of the patrol car, which I think must have been absolutely terrifying. You know, can you imagine being in a situation where you are literally sat outside the home of your abusers? You know previously when one of your siblings has run away that they've been returned to home and it probably got seriously worse because of that. And now you are within arm's reach of that hellhole. You know, the trust that Jordan had to just think it's worth the risk must have taken the courage of a warrior. It actually took two minutes of knocking before Louise and David even answered the door. And why? Well, you know why. Because they probably realised that their number was up and they were running around trying to make it look less dreadful than the police were going to discover. They answer the door, obviously, why are you here? We are so perplexed that you are at our house, you know? Because even if they've registered that the police have come, they're certainly not going to be like, game's up, come in, our house is horrific and I've got all these children chained to the beds. Instead, they are obviously trying to either buy time or act like they've done nothing wrong. And the police say, we're here for a welfare check. We've had a call off on your daughters. When those officers cross that threshold, wow, it was utterly shocking what they found. The house was filthy, the stench that was emanating from that house was absolutely overwhelming. Rubbish covered every inch of space. Again, when they start digging through that rubbish, what do they find? They find decaying pets again. Can you believe that? Just so abusive, so neglectful that pets have died, literally starved to death and died in that home. Feces all over the carpet, really ingrained. This is later established, of course, that basically the reason for that is the Turpins would not allow the children to use the toilet so they had no other opportunity but to actually use the floor. Then the officers come across the actual children and they are stunned. All of the kids are absolutely filthy. They found a 22 year old chained to the bedpost by a wrist and ankle, two others, 11 and 13 year old. They hadn't got shackles on, but it was clear that they had been shackled until moments before the police entered the house because Louise and David had been rushing through the house trying to get them out of the shackles whilst the officers were on the doorstep. Can you imagine what the police are thinking at this point? This will be like a once in a career moment where they are literally rescuing children from the gates of hell. And they must have been knowing that in that moment when they're going through making sure that each of those children is freed from that horror. They must have been thinking, I've never seen and I will never see this again. You know, they were saviours in that moment, they really will. The children, when they were asked by the authorities about the shackles, they actually confessed that they would sometimes be shackled for months at a time. Remember, they're not going to the toilet either, as in the hygienic toilet that we'd use. So they're not just chained and shackled. They can't have any of their hygiene needs met. They're literally in their own decay. Now, originally, they said that the parents used to use rope to restrain them, but understandably, when one of their sons tried to escape and actually managed to break the bonds, they decided that, you know, that wasn't effective enough, so they used chains and padlocks instead. They also had rules by the parents that included not being allowed to exercise, so they couldn't even meet their most basic needs. Remember, children need a lot of exercise just to burn off excess energy. And even worse, those children would sometimes be locked in cages. Every single one of the kids was noted to be incredibly thin, very pale, and very, very dirty. It blows my mind that I'm talking about real people here. For all of us who know children, let alone have the blessings of having children, the idea that adults, parents, could knowingly and willingly put their children in such harm is mind-blowing. The fact that they kept having children, because it was God's will, 
You know, I think you missed the bit where God's will was also to look after your children. But the fact that they got to do that and then abandon them this way is just heartbreaking. Again, what did they find? Well, they found that the youngest child, the youngest one, wasn't actually badly looked after. It seems like the younger children were favoured, looking back at what we were talking about earlier on, when they moved all the other kids to the trailer apart from the very youngest. So there's something about their psychology where they can manage the child that they can fully control. And you can when they're very little, they're completely within your control. So they're the ones that actually get treated not well. I mean, they're living in a hovel, but certainly they're not starved. They haven't got malnutrition. Now, when the police actually took a look at all the 13 children, they thought they were all minors. Their malnourishment was so grave for those kids that they'd had their growth stunted. In fact, when they looked at their real ages by having conversations with the young people and finding that information out, they discovered that seven of them were over 18. In fact, their eldest, Jennifer, she was 29 years of age when they saved her. She had had a third of her life stolen by these people. And she was so underfed that they actually discovered that her muscle growth had stagnated. At 29 years of age, she weighed 82 pounds. That's under six stone. Tiny. And one of their 11-year-old children, well, they had an arm circumference. 11-year-old, bear this in mind. An arm circumference, the same as a four-month-old baby. A four-month-old baby. A 12-year-old of theirs was literally the size of a seven-year-old. And they weren't just physically impaired, they were cognitively impaired. They had very little understanding of the outside world. They were completely unfamiliar with what medicine was, with what police were. So they had no understanding of the world that they lived in per se. And some of them were so weak because of this hostility and consistent abuse and neglect and abandonment, they could hardly walk. Every single one of them had suffered some form of nerve damage. And that means that they will be affected likely for the rest of their lives. So we're not just talking about kids who are rescued and go on to thrive. We're talking about children who have their pasts and presents stolen. And even when they're freed from that situation, they were placed in a position where for the rest of their lives, ultimately, they're going to experience problems because of that lack of care. Again, like I said, there's a strange correlation with the fact that they maltreat all of the children apart from that two-year-old. So again, this child that I talked about momentarily ago, this is the only child that Louise and David seem to care about. And does that say again something about their immaturity emotionally, that they only really care about children who can't communicate and can't do things by themselves? That childish connection that then relates back to the way that they act in Disneyland and so on and so forth, i.e. they're happy to present something that seems to be how a family should look to the world, but they don't actually have any of the context required for the emotional, social and psychological foundations that are needed to bring up children in a healthy way. So they kind of abandon children as soon as they get to a point where they can walk by themselves, talk by themselves and so on and so forth. What's shocking about the Turpins is when I looked into this case, they'd never ever been on the authorities' radar. So they weren't aware of them. Behind these closed doors, this horrible abuse is playing out and social services aren't aware. So authorities in California and Texas they confirmed that they had no records of any prior arrests or any prior reports on child abuse. Somehow, David and Louise did manage to fool literally everyone, family members included. After the children had been rescued, the first thing they do is they take them to hospital. And actually, they ended up staying there for several weeks. At this point, they get treated for various issues. This includes heart damage because they had had a massive lack of nutrients. They were treated for cognitive impairments and also, as I noted, neuropathy because of the nerve issues. Authorities actually start talking to them, of course. They want to understand what on earth has gone on. So they start speaking to the Turpin children, but they also get 
to read through their very extensive journals. And those journals literally documented their daily lives. It documented the abuse that they'd suffered. So they're given this real insight into the hell that these children and young adults have dealt with on a daily basis. It revealed this utter nightmarish experiences that they'd had. There'd been violence. The children had been beaten until they were bled. They choked them. The kids were thrown across the room by them. They even had their hair yanked out. And also when they found the kids and they brought them to the hospital, they did actually find things like bruises on their arms so they could see directly that there was physical abuse in spite of what they then read. Now, allegedly, Louise and David would quote the Bible when they beat the children. This was to justify their actions. I'm not sure that keeping a children in squalor, not feeding them, literally allowing dead animals to decay in said area, not allowing them to use the toilet, and then beating them with a Bible because you managed to find a verse that somehow justifies that kind of punishment is anything like godly. I'm just going to put it out there. I'm pretty sure that the big G.O.D. is going to be that happy with you, Louise and David, even though you did occasionally dress them up and take them to Disneyland. I mean, arguably, I think when you think about being Christian and your actions, you certainly apply yourself to, shall we say, the darker arts and the darker belief systems. Going back to Louise like in witchcraft. I know there's white witches, guys, I appreciate it. Good old white witches, not a problem. But I think Louise potentially wasn't in the space of white witchery and was probably more involved with, shall we say, the big L-U-C-I-F-E-R. That's all I'm saying. I hope I spelled that right. And if I didn't, I'm dyslexic. So that's an excuse. But the kids were also forced to memorize scripture. So they were constantly being given these tasks to do that gave their parents license to hurt them if they failed. They were really harshly punished whenever they were seen to do something wrong. So again, the parents would say, well, you've just sinned. And then they would be allowed to beat them. And let me put this in context. The sins that they would be beaten for were things like wasting water because they were seen to wash their hands above the wrist. And Jordan said when she was interviewed that the truth is it wasn't that they had to do anything specifically wrong. The parents were just always looking for an excuse to punish them. So it was a way of giving themselves license to abuse their children as opposed to their children deserving any punishment whatsoever. And Jordan actually reflected on her own punishment and said, if I did one little thing wrong, I was going to be beaten and not just beat until I bled. So we're talking about highest level abuse here. Jordan and her sister were so aware that even though they hadn't got any kind of interaction with the outside world, so to speak, what was happening was fundamentally wrong. And they actually managed to hide a camera in a Barbie doll, which captured the abuse. So you can see they knew it was wrong. But in spite of the fact that they managed to capture this kind of abuse, the majority of abuse just took place in a more, shall we say, systematic, sadistic torment by doing things like not letting them use the bathroom. They were only allowed one shower a year. We know that they were starved horribly because of the results from the hospital. In fact, the children were only fed once per day. This is whilst... Oh, makes me so angry this this is whilst those parents would put fresh pies just out of reach of the kids so there they are those children shackled and the parents know how hungry they are and to make this even more fun for them because this is parents who are having fun Louise and David are enjoying this without a doubt putting the fresh pie in front of their starving child knowing that they couldn't reach it in fact, those kids lived off things like bread and peanut butter, mustard, ketchup. They even ate ice at times because they were so hungry. And this is whilst their parents were sat gorging themselves on takeaways in front of them. And if any of those kids 
try to do what any normal person would do, which is just steal food because, my God, they were starving, that would result in them being chained to their beds. Investigators also turned up some utterly bizarre things. They found children's toys that were in the house, but they were still in the boxes. So they were there, but the kids were not allowed to open them. How sadistic is that? To, like, bring things into the house and be like, this is what you could have but you're not going to have it. But you can look at it and you can imagine what your life may have been like if you were allowed to play like normal kids are allowed to play with this. Sadistic. One Christmas day, David and Louise actually bought eight new children's bikes and those eight new children's bikes, they remained outside their house completely unused to the point where the sun bleached them. And there's something really psychologically manipulative there. First off, everybody knows that children want bikes. Like, it's the biggest Christmas present, isn't it? My parents bought me a second-hand bike when I was, like, seven years of age. My sister got one as well. She was 11 at the time. I remember what that bike looked like, the bright redness of it, the black seat, the little back handle that went on the back of it so that your kind of back went into it. I remember thinking that I was the luckiest kid that had ever walked this earth. And before we went anywhere else, me and my sister went out on those bikes feeling like we had won the lottery. It would have been the football pools back then. But we felt like we had won everything going because it was just a dream come true, right? And a bike gives you a sense of freedom and escape. So I think that they did it because one, it represents what every kid wants, a new bike, and two, it represented freedom. And the fact that they basically left them to be bleached by the sun, never used, gave them a direct message, which is, you're going nowhere. Just tormenting them. Kids were obviously, you won't be surprised to understand, denied any kind of healthcare. They hadn't seen a doctor in years, they hadn't seen a dentist. So anything that they had to deal with on a medical front, they were just left to deal with. And you can imagine they'd have got sick at times with all that filth in the home. They also didn't escape sexual abuse. The allegations that Jordan made were very clear. She told the court that her father sexually abused her in a TV room in the house. This is when she lived in Marita. And he basically called her over to him, pulled her pants down and then put her on his lap. He actually tried to continue to abuse her, even though she was asking him to stop. Like I said, even though she hadn't had a reference in the rest of the world experience where she could be told that this kind of abuse is wrong, she knew it within her. She had an instinct, this is not acceptable. And she was pleading for him to stop and he did but only because Louise was walking up the stairs and that interruption stopped him going any further. And he actually said to her, you better not tell your mum, you better not tell anyone else what's happened. And you can imagine that she wouldn't have wanted to because my God, the wrath of what she would have encountered would have been terrifying. Now, I guess for all of us, the one thing that we think about that was the one small mercy in this case, and certainly what I had thought when I was looking at this case initially, is that at least they had their siblings, right? At least they had people who were with them for company who were going through the same horrific ordeal that they were experiencing. But no, not even that was possible because they weren't even allowed to communicate with one another. In fact, they'd be locked in different rooms of the house. And if they actually spoke to each other without permission, well, there would be really severe repercussions. So they weren't even given the blessing of just being able to have a relationship with one another that was considered at least normal, i.e. being able to just have a conversation with somebody who's in the same space as you. No, that was denied them. They also lived a completely and weirdly nocturnal life. The whole family would stay awake till about 4 a.m., and then they'd sleep throughout the day. Now, I think that part of that is because 
the family didn't want, at least the parents didn't want, the children to be outside in the day per se. They didn't want them to be up in the day because that would mean that other people could look into their lives, so to speak, if they saw children who never left the house or if they heard things that, again, made them feel that there might be something going on behind closed doors and that could have entertained social services getting involved or the police being called. So they avoided that. So that meant that, of course, that they slept throughout the day. The media clearly blew up when this came out because the details of the children enduring this horrible situation was fed slowly to the media. And as I said earlier on, this led to the Turpin family home being called the House of Horrors. And boy, it lived up to its name, didn't it? It absolutely lived up to its name. But this is where it gets really freaky. Bear in mind what Louise has done. She doesn't get it. Genuinely, guys, Louise Turpin does not get the seriousness of what she's done. She doesn't appreciate the allegations. She doesn't understand that what she did was horrendously wrong. In fact, she ends up writing an apology letter to the kids and she's apologizing for chaining them up. And she says, you know what? It won't happen again. I'll be a better mum. Okay then. Well, I mean, you could charge her with all these offences, being in mind that she's been a neglectful, abusive parent for decades. Or we could just accept this little apology letter and it'll be fine. Clearly, the naivety plays out there. Yes, I don't know what accent that was either. I just don't know. I went in some cartoon character. But basically, she's oblivious, isn't she? Oblivious that she's never going to get to be a mother again. All of her children are going to get taken away from her. And... More importantly, Louise, you're going to be going to prison for a long time. This total lack of connection with what she's done. In fact, it seems like she believed that the likelihood would be that she'd just have to attend parenting classes. Now, I'm not going to deny Louise might be offered parenting classes in prison for the next however many decades but it's not gonna be at her local social services intervention unit where then she can return to said children and bring them up, you know, as a regular parent. David wasn't naive though. He absolutely knew he was bang to rights and he knew there were gonna be serious consequences. When David and Louise were charged, they were charged collectively with 88 felonies, 88. Louise was charged with 12 counts of torture, 12 counts of false imprisonment, eight counts of child abuse, seven counts of cruelty to a dependent adult, and one count of assault. She pleaded guilty at Riverside saying, I can't believe I did this. I'm a terrible parent. Throw but she didn't do that. Of course she didn't do that. She was like, ha, ha, not guilty. I'm not guilty. How could I be guilty of any of those things? I think that you had decaying, rotting animals, um, literally in your home. Okay, but they were just animals. You change your kids to the beds. Maybe. You didn't let them use the toilet. Why are you going not guilty? Well, I just think I need some parenting classes and everything will be fine. Blow, blows mind, blows mind every time. How would you go not guilty? But she did. So she pleads not guilty, as I've said, at Riverside Superior Court in September 2018. So we're only talking a few years ago. Now, David faced the same charges, but he's also charged with one count of a lewd act on a child by force. And he pleaded, yeah, say it all together. Yeah, not guilty again. Not guilty to all the charges. <laughs> I'm sure that whoever was defending them was like, guys, are you really sure you wanna go not guilty? Yeah, we're really sure. But are you really sure? We're really sure. Are you? Yeah. Okay. Can I maybe have a conversation with you about reality? No, we want to renew our vows with an Elvis impersonator at Las Vegas and we need to do that next year, so sort it out. I imagine it went something like that. So anyway, they go not guilty. But then, thank God, in February 2019, they changed their plea. And they do plead guilty to all offences. And you know why? You know why? 
these parents who have literally kept their children in horrific squalor, abused them reprehensibly, denied them their fundamental basic rights. And I mean to freedom and simple things like food and sanitation. They've happily done that to those poor young people. And yet the reason they go guilty is because they don't want to put their kids through the ordeal of a trial and having to testify. Liars. They're liars. The reason that they didn't want their children to testify is because those kids were amazing and they knew that they would get on that stand and they would tell the truth about the sordid details of their crimes and everybody would know even more about the despicable, diabolical, reprehensible excuses for parents that they were. The district attorney in this case said this, this is among the worst, most aggravated child abuse cases that I have ever seen or been involved in in my career as a prosecutor. Stern words, because believe me, he will have seen a lot of abuse, but this was the worst. Louise and David did go through a psychological evaluation. Now Louise gets diagnosed with histronic personality disorder. So this disorder is actually more common in women. And if you were to look at what we expect to see in it, the symptoms include constant attention seeking. They'll often behave inappropriately or dramatically to get attention. Self-esteem will be very dependent on others approving them. Often they don't have very positive feelings of self-worth or they don't feel a high level of self-esteem, often very over-emotional, they have distorted self-image, they're considered by others often to be very self-centered, almost obsessively self-centered, and this means that they rarely show any concern for others. I suppose when we think about how she's acted, we could say that that diagnosis explains quite a lot of her previous behavior. You know, think about the swinging activities, she wants to be on a reality TV show, regularly renewing their wedding vows. This all lends us some insight onto fitting that kind of classification, although I appreciate it. Lots of people on TV shows that are reality-based and also a lot of people fancy renewing their vows at good old Las Vegas with an impersonator of Elvis. That's not a problem, but I think when we build it into what we know about her, these kind of exhibit certain tendencies that she has. 5th of October 2018, the judge rejects a request by Louise's attorney for her case to be transferred to a mental health court. So basically, they're looking at getting her a sentence that is denoted by her mental health issues. Now, if she'd succeeded, she would have got to enter a treatment program. And with respect, that could have left her having all the charges dropped against her. So the judge gets to look at this and basically says, no, no. You might have histronic personality disorder, but that does not contribute to the level of abuse and neglect that your children endured. And they're right. That judge is completely right. There will be many people with histronic personality disorder. And let me tell you, there will be great parents. It really drives me mad when we give these labels and then courts will look at them and say, yeah, well, that's an excuse for extreme abuse because it labels people, particularly people with personality disorders, with that kind of belief system through others that they're capable of these heinous acts, which they're not. And the judge actually said, look, you pose a risk, a really big risk to public safety. And because of that, you're not going in a mental health unit. You will be tried in the criminal courts. 22nd of February 2019, both David and Louise were sentenced to life imprisonment. Now, they've got the possibility of parole after 25 years, but that means looking at their ages and their general level of health, that it's highly unlikely that they'll ever get out. They'll probably spend the rest of their lives in prison because realistically, even if they did make it to a place where they could be considered for parole, I think the seriousnesses of their offences would mean that they would unlikely ever get it. 
So even if they make it to a point where they might be ready for parole, I think the board will look at it and be like, these people are not safe to walk the streets. The psychology of the Turpins, when I looked at it, is terrifying. If you think about it, parents, most of us, the vast majority of us, and I mean the vast, vast, vast majority of us, whether you have a baby at 15 or 50 these days, your natural inclination is to know that you love your child beyond measure and you will do anything to protect them. That care and nurture is hardwired. But instead of protecting their blessings, all those children they had the opportunity to protect, they literally became their kids' tormentors, their kids' abusers. Now, in the majority of child abuse cases, parents, or what's known as in loco parentis, which is people who are in charge of the children, it turns out that they tend to be the perpetrators. So according to the National Child Abuse and Neglect Data System, 71.8% of child abuse or neglect cases occur at the hands of the victim's parents. Now, I will also add to that, that in the majority of those cases, alcohol or drug abuse is usually involved. This does not seem to be the case with the Turpins. You know, they don't seem to have those dependency issues. They don't seem to have those losses with reality that leads to uh, amplification in horrible behavior. Not giving an excuse, by the way, to people who take drugs and drink and then are abusive. You're abusers, full stop. Throw the book at them, as far as I'm concerned. But to be straight headed and to engage in that kind of torture of their own kids, yeah, it's highly uncommon. And it's really uncommon because it's incredibly hard to hide. Usually people witness it, they see it. They call social services, child protection officers, they get involved with the police. But we know that the Turpins were very clever and manipulative by keeping those children behind closed doors. Also, when I've looked at this case, trying to figure out the reason why the Turpins treated their children this way. I mean, it must involve a range of really complex issues. I think possibly there's mental illness, emotional dysfunction. Clearly we have the moral and religious beliefs, although it's a bastardization of those beliefs. And I guess we could introduce the fact that there are some religious sects that do have some very hard line structures. For example, groups such as Branch Davidians, they practice complete, and I mean literal complete dominion and control over their families by the father figure. So there are sects of religions that clearly do believe in domination and actually are punitive in the way that they deal with discipline. Definitely, we can say that Louise and David had a desire for power and control and they liked the authority that they had over their family. So they created a world where they, I suppose, were completely in charge. Personally, I think that if they were to do the psychopathy test with them, they would probably score quite highly on it. They're both narcissistic. They had no care for their children's well-being. They had absolutely no concern for the maltreatment that they bestowed on those kids. I guess we could also say alternatively that maybe they've got some kind of delusional paranoid disorder. So this grandiose belief that they knew how to care for their kids above everybody else. Maybe they had this huge mistrust of the outside world and they had some really confused idea of what correction, protection and punishment could do to make sure that their children didn't end up like what they considered were the reprobates of the outside world. I think that's highly unlikely though. I suppose we could say that there's this tiny fraction of a potential that they were trying to keep the child safe from the outside world. So they were keeping them captive, but again, that's completely delusional because they were the ones creating horrific harm for them. And even though I do not believe for one second this delusion is possible because I always like to explore all potentials. We could say, maybe they believe they were caring adequately for their kids. I mean, literally, I like to cover all bases, but that one, I think, would actually be delusional of me to believe. But nonetheless, 
in some tiny fragment of their fractured minds. Maybe they thought that was caring for their kids. I don't believe it. Now, part of the reason the Turpins were able to get away with the abuse for so long is because the kids weren't privately schooled. And private schools in lots of states, including California, they're not licensed by the state education department. So no agency actually regulates or oversees them. On one level, I don't think that's a terrible thing because I think the state interferes in every single area of our lives and should butt out quite a lot. And certainly they're not people who should be able to dictate to you what you do with your children if you're doing things that are positive and progressive with them. But you also think that if there is no engagement, so no requirement for a parent to show what your child is doing on a home ed level, then that can mean that children fall foul of those scenarios of protection. So that is something that I think maybe could improve. Now, after the children were freed, the attorney who was representing them said this. They are all working toward their own independence. They don't want their identity to people who they meet to be one of being a victim and of having to relive this trauma every time they meet somebody. They want people to know them for who they are and what they are going to be doing, which I think is commendable and completely understandable. You are not just your past, you are your present, you are your future. And if you are always marked by this horrendous scenario that you've had to experience and exist within, then it's like you never get the chance to leave it. And that's why it's paramount for people to understand that victims of abuse want to be survivors who are independent of that abuse. Yes, you carry it with you, but it does not define you. And six of the youngest Turpin children, well, they went into foster care. Now, personally, and this really upset me because I would imagine after children have been failed so awfully by their parents, and I guess by society, because these children were just left essentially to rot, you'd imagine that special care would be taken of them because they've had this horrific ordeal. And you'd think that the authorities would be like, this family's abuse has been so horrific, so systematic, so permanent in their experiences that we need to make damn sure that their future in this system is one that has a happy ending. But that wasn't the case. For some of those children, it was basically out of the frying pan into the fire. Five of them were placed in a foster home where guess what? Abuse was taking place. Yeah. So they go from one horrific scenario into another. So their foster parents were actually arrested and charged. Another Turpin child, who's now an adult, well, she was placed in a foster home where her foster parents said that she understood why her parents would chain her up. That in itself tells you all you need to know about the type of human being that she was placed in. And it is really deeply upsetting because these children have been failed all the way through. And you would imagine the one place that that would change is when they went into the system a system that was meant to understand just how tragic their whole lives had been up until that point. Isn't it shocking to imagine that these children who've already been horribly failed are being failed further? November 2021, in fact, there's an investigation that's carried out and they actually establish that some of the Turpin children were actually being neglected by Riverside County Social Services. Also, the adult children think about how naive those kids would be, even though they're adults, think about their lives, they haven't had foundations, they haven't become savvy, they don't understand the world and how it operates because they've never had access to it, they haven't formed the resilience required, and yet where do they place these children? Yes, they're adults, but where do they place these naive young adults? Well, they place them in crime-ridden neighborhoods. One of them had been assaulted, some of them were homeless. They relied on couch surfing. When they got food, they'd go to churches because they couldn't afford to pay for it. None of them as well, and this is something that really, really offends my sensibilities. None of them were able to access the hundreds of thousands of dollars that have been donated to them by the public. Because the thing about you guys is that when you see that people have been betrayed in such horrific ways, 
when fundraisers go out, clearly you put money in there because you just want to know that you made some kind of a difference. You want to extend the compassion that they were denied. You want to remind those young adults and children that even though you weren't cared for by the people who should have cared for you, we care for you. Us strangers, you'll never meet us, but we still believe that you deserved better, right? And they've been denied any of that access because the money basically got paid into a controlled fund. It was a trust fund that a court-appointed public guardian was in charge of. Well, what are you doing with the money? That doesn't sound like a guardian. That sounds like a con artist. Oh, it's all this money that's for the Turpin children. I am now the court-appointed guardian, but you can't have it, Turpin children, because I'm protecting you. It's amazing how protection can seem to be anything but. Because all the time you hear this played out, well, it was for their own protection. Well, protection isn't meant to make you feel really bad and protection isn't meant to mean that you're homeless and starving. One of the Turpin children actually wanted to buy a bike with some of the money and was told no. Yeah, they had no other form of transportation, but was told, no, you can't have a bike. Jordan Turpin, who is amazing, and if you look at some of her videos when she speaks, she's so eloquent and intelligent. She said that she actually got released from a foster home without any warning. So when she was released, she had no life skills, she had no accommodation, absolutely no knowledge of how to get food or healthcare. And this was meant to be them being looked after. My God, if this is people being protected by the system, Christ only knows how it is when it's not trying to do a good job. The district attorney actually stated this. They have been victimized again by the system. And that is unimaginable to me that we could have had the worst child abuse case that I've ever seen, maybe one of the worst in Californian history, and that we would then not even be able to get it together to give them the basic needs, their basic necessities. It's an understatement. That's an understatement. But I get where he's going with that. I mean, it contravenes every expectation that any of us listening to this tonight will feel that was required. Because, my God, you would imagine that they would have been scooped up and looked after in a way that they absolutely deserve to be, but that you would just have a compassionate instinct to do. You know, what a privilege to be offered an opportunity to look after these children who've been so neglected, to show them a world that they can deserve and should expect to deserve because of the care and consideration you give them. But no, it just feels like they were exploited again and again. It's tragic. They were failed by their parents and they were failed by the social services system that was meant to help them transition to new lives. And that for me is such a hard point to end on because of the fact that what I want to be able to tell you is incredible stories of success that I'm sure there will be in the future. But right now, the Turpin children who deserve so much more well, it seems that they are still fighting to get what is rightfully theirs. They are still fighting a system that failed them in the first place. And that for me is unforgivable. I think if you take some time to look at some of the interviews with some of the Turpin children, what you will be blown away by is their incredible character, their wit, their compassion, and their intelligence. And I hope to God the individual, each one of them, finds their happiness, their peace, the families that they deserve, and a future that absolutely we all believe that they're entitled to. But in the meantime, it's just that reminder, isn't it? It's that reminder that really bad things happen to really good people. And then when those bad things get discovered, bad things happen again, because sometimes, particularly when money is concerned, exploitation is rife. I hope that you found this case interesting as far as knowing a little bit more about what happened to the Turpin children. I hope in the future we'll be able to report on the successes of those children, the ones that want to be front facing in society. And I hope that yet again, it's just a reminder to all of us, if you see anything weird going on, 
in families around you, in houses nearby you, risk to offend. Just take a risk, offend someone, because you might just save a life. Thanks for joining me. As ever, if you'd like to get involved in my membership, please do. You can join on YouTube, Patreon, loads of new podcasts coming out. So I'm hoping to build that channel into something that you really enjoy. All your likes, your comments, all of your subscriptions. Thank you so much. You guys are amazing. I adore you. And yeah, I'm wearing my Kenny's Crime Cult top. You can get my merch as you know, the links are below. See you again soon. Thanks for spending this time with me. Be safe. Look after yourselves.